Hey everyone, Dylan and Carlo here from All You Can Board with another video. And today we've got a cool topic. We're talking about the games on our shelf that we love but never play. And I say never, and it's probably not never, but either don't play enough or for some reason they just don't get played, but it's not anything to do with their quality. It's not anything to do with whether or not we like them. They're still in our collection for a reason. It just for some reason they don't hit the table. I feel like sometimes people have these games in their collection and they're the shelf of shame games. They just, they're too complicated or whatever. And that is absolutely fair criteria yep. and they could end up on our list for that. But there's also games that I know how to play, I have played, but for some reason just have not played in a long period of time or rarely play. Yep. And I think we just want to bring attention to some of those games because it might also help you if, if you're looking to some of these games to think, you know, is that going to be a game that I'm going to love, but I'm just going to look at my shelf and it's going to sit there, yep, right? Yeah, absolutely. And I think a lot of these are going to have different reasons why they sit unplayed. So yeah, I'm going to go over the reasons for each of them. So Yeah, so... I'm not going to waste any more time. We're going to jump right into it with my number five, and then we'll go into Carlos. So my number five game that is underplayed now on my shelf, rarely ever play, is Cottage Garden. Mm. So I really like this game. I'm a huge fan of it, and specifically, we got I fell in love with this game when we were actually bringing it to the cabin when we were going mm -hmm. on cabin trips. This was before the pandemic. Um, it was a great game to play in that kind of setting. It fit the theme, it fit like yeah. everything going on. It's a polyomino game from Uwe Rosenberg. Um, you have different polyomino uh, boards and as you complete them, you're, you're fresh in game new boards. So the boards are kind of, uh, you know, going through a little bit of a, uh, you know, I don't even know what the word is, but you're just basically getting new boards and trading off the boards you had. Um, so it, it's a quick playing polyamino game and you really feel like you're accomplishing things every single turn. And I really enjoy it. The reason it's on the li this list is there are so many polyamino games yeah. these days. It's a genre that is just like blown up, right? Like, I, I, I mean, blown up or maybe it's always been, you know, really popular and just been getting exponentially more popular. Um, but even on my shelf, I've got I've got um, Baron Park, I've got New York Zoo, I've got Patchwork, I've got Feast for Odin. I've yeah, got we reviewed City. Spring Meadow on our channel, which is part of this yeah. trilogy not too long ago as well. Yeah, played Isle of Cats. Like yeah, this. Indian Summer is another one that yeah. we don't have, but it is is on this uh, this list. So there's just too many polyomino games. If I'm going to sit down and I feel like playing a polyomino game, unfortunately, Cottage Garden just doesn't make the cut because I'd much rather play at this point New York Zoo. I feel like I get that quick plan polyomino experience that Cottage Garden kind of was. I get that from New York Zoo now. Baron Park has the multiple different boards that you're kind of like, you know, mm -hmm. you pick in the boards you want, you get that from yeah. there. Patchwork is, is you know, the, the the predecessor to this is the one that kind of started this off for Uwe Rosenberg. There's so many options. If I want a heavier polyomino game, I have that now too. So it just never slots in. It's a game that I love and honestly, at some point might end up leaving my collection and not because of its quality, just because my collection has grown beyond Cottage Garden, I think is the best way to describe yeah. it. It's, it's so. one of those ones that just, it might not ever be your first pick anymore and because it's your second or third in a lot of categories, right? Sure. Yeah, and, the, and that's the thing is if it's even the third and fourth pick, if I'm picking a couple polyomino games to bring to the cabin or play, it still doesn't make the cut, unfortunately. Right. So yeah, I think I think you could love this game, but just if you have a lot of polyomino games, it might be one that slots under if it, if it you know, if it doesn't really resonate with you. So, Fair enough. so number five, Cottage Garden. It's a great pick. All right, and my number five is Isle of Sky. So this is by Alexander Pfister. Um, Most people are probably familiar with his heavier games and newer ones like uh, Great Western Trail from a few years ago, Maracaibo and stuff. Um, this was, I think, from 2014 or 15. It's a tile laying game. Um, <clears throat> honestly, looks a lot like Carcassonne, a lot of the rules are the same too with how you lay tiles down. But basically, instead of everyone building a common area like in Carcassonne, everyone's building their own little um, their own little version of the Isle of Sky. Basically, uh, what makes this game really cool? Well, there's a couple things. First off, there is auctioning, like bidding on tiles. So you're drawing tiles from a bag, you put them in front of you, you set secret amounts privately that you're setting the price of these tiles for, and then everyone lifts their screens up and you go around bid or like buying people's tiles for the prices they set. But if no one buys your tile, then you have to pay the price that you set to pay for the tile to keep for yourself. So some rounds you're getting more tiles from other people or your own tiles, and there's different rounds like uh, end game scoring goals that change up every round. It's like this round you're trying to meet these goals, next round you're trying to meet these goals. So it's a really cool twist on tiling without making things too complicated, right? Like I think the first yeah. time we played this, we were surprised at how quick and yeah. how simple it played. And the reason why we don't play it as often is because it just feels like when we do, it goes up to five players, and when we do have three, four, five players, we're always like wanting to play a bigger, heavier strategy game that's been sitting on the shelf for a while. So this gets neglected, and I always feel bad because I love it. Every time I play it, and everyone I've shown it to has really liked it. One of the better tiling games I've played, but for some reason, it's just, again, it's rarely going to be my first choice. 
So I think it's going to yeah. be it's going to be a bit of a casualty of the pandemic too, because even when we do have groups back again, there's now going to be an influx of games that we're going to want to play. Yeah, at a four good point. Players right. that this one is not necessarily going to you know make the cut. Uh, before those, so it's going to take a while, I think, to even potentially get it back. It's to the true. Table. But the best thing, I just want to say, the best thing about this game, um, it's not the only game to do it by by any means. But the way that all the the game goals that are in the middle of the board, like every round, what you're trying to accomplish and earn points from, the way that it changes up and like the tiles end up in different mm. spots and stuff like that, that's what I've enjoyed so much about it. Is that anytime I play, even if you've seen different objectives before, having them in different rounds and which rounds you know it applies in, having Absolutely. to figure out that puzzle is so much fun. And, and every game, you're like, oh, that's interesting. I haven't seen this combination in this way. This is going to be a weird scoring game. Right, because do you go yeah. after certain tiles to score them now or do you get them just right. to secure them for two rounds from now when you know yeah. they're going to score even though they might do nothing for you right now? I love so. the way it does the objectives. Super yeah, fun. yeah. which if you haven't played this, the objectives work similar in Cartographers if you've played that where certain rounds it scores different objectives. But anyway, very cool game. Unfortunately, it doesn't get played as often as I'd like. That is Isle of Sky, my number five. All right, my number four... My number four is Everdell. Mm. So I love this game. Um, if you've seen our review from when we first started All You Can Board, it was near the beginning. Um, I think this is one of my highest reviewed games. I really, really enjoy Everdell. And to be honest, I don't even have a really, really good reason why it doesn't see play. The best I can come up with is that it's a worker placement game and a kind of a tableau builder at the same time. And when it comes to worker placement games, there are other worker placement games that just always take priority for me. And stiff I think, competition. Yeah, yeah it, that's the thing, is a stiff competition. In terms of theme, it's almost unmatched in my collection. I love the theme. The Tidal Blades is probably the closest now in terms of like just absolutely capturing me with the way it looks on the table. So if I'm playing with my partner, Everdell has a better chance of seeing play. My partner's not the biggest fan of worker placement games. So it often just loses out to games like Champions of Midgard, for instance. Um, I always bring that one up for worker placements because it's one of my favorites in my collection. If I'm going to play a worker placement game, if I can get four people together that all want to play it, I would much rather try to convince them to play Champions of Midgard than I would Or Feast for Odin. Or Feast for Odin. What are you talking about? That would be your number one. Or uh, Keyflower. Absolutely. Okay, there's more. Hey, <laughs> thanks, for, thanks for calling me out on all these games. <laughs> I'm just like, I'm not mentioning games I know That's you true. like even more than Key Midgard. Keyflower even is, a, is another huge... Like, great example, because Keyflower is one we've actually played virtually a few times yeah. during the pandemic, yeah. um, that I love playing, and there's so many people I know that haven't experienced it yet, yeah. that I'd much rather teach them that than I would introduce them to Everdell for the first time. Um, there's obviously, like, tons of expansion with this. Like, there's tons of reasons to, to play it. Everyone, or not everyone, lots of people love this game. Um, it's a huge hit on, on Kickstarter every time it goes on there with the expansions. So you've probably heard of it, and you're probably surprised that I don't play it enough. It's just, honestly, the, yeah, the stiff competition is the best way to describe mm -hmm. it. There's just, there's too many games that I would rather play instead of it because it gives you a more satisfying result from the worker placement genre. Um, but again... In terms of relaxed worker placement games with that tableau building that feels a little bit different and like chain the animals together, you know, you're only gonna get that from Everdell. I find I'll, one thing I'll say is I'll find I find that with Everdell, there's other worker placement games I have in my collection. Even though I've, I've played them like you know ten times, for instance, I think Keyflower I've played tons of at times at this point. Every time I play it, it feels a little bit different based on what other people are doing, how they're bidding for tiles. Even though I've seen all these tiles before and I know what to expect from the game from that, the game feels different and I don't know what to expect from the players around the table. Okay. With Everdell, some of that still holds true, but I also know when you start to get certain animals, I know exactly what they're going to go for. I know that this animal mm. pairs with this animal. I know that if you grab this, you're going to want right. to grab like, that. So okay. it starts to feel sort of like... Not that it's playing itself, but I, I can start to see what players are going to do just from grabbing a single animal sometimes. Right. Like, I remember, there's like, yeah, if you get the husband, you obviously want to get yeah. the wife with it or exactly. if you get the whatever. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That's a great example. Makes the sense. husband and the wife. So, like, those type of things make Everdell a little less spontaneous, I guess, in, in the game. Whereas Keyflower, for instance, is probably the best example of the ones in my collection where because of the way that people can bid and because that every tile affects what people are going to go for and how you build your little little city and stuff, um, it's so unpredictable that makes it so much fun to play. Mm -hmm. So Everdell's a great game. I just don't play it enough given the other games in my collection. Yeah, that's honestly one of the nicest looking games you can find. Yeah, guaranteed. Nice pick. Mm -hmm. All right, and my number four pick now is Bonanza. So oh, this nice. is uh, an Uwe Rosenberg game, one of his oldest, one of his first, and unlike probably anything else Uwe Rosenberg, most people have played. So this is a simple negotiation game. Whenever people talk about like Settlers of Catan, or whatever, I'm always like, just play Bonanza. It's, it has all the negotiation without the things that, that you might not like from Catan. 
For those who don't know, it's a pretty simple bean trading game. Uh, the main sort of twist of the game is you have a hand of cards, but you can never rearrange the order of the cards. So like when you draw a card, it always stays at the back of your hand. And when you're playing cards, you can only play the front card in your hand. But you can trade cards from anywhere. And the idea is you're planting beans and you have these little fields in front of you. Um, anyways, I won't go into all the rules, but what makes this game and why I think this gets so underplayed is it, it really is dependent on the group. So I remember talking a while back to uh, my sister-in-law about it, and she was saying that she was playing it with her in-laws or some family. She was like, oh, I kind of felt flat. Like, I was like, what, Bonanza? And then I realized it's because of the way they were just like, do you want to trade this? No. Okay. Good next turn, whatever. And like, from the very first time I played this, I was introduced to this by people who were like making the most ridiculous, like, okay, I'll, tr I'll give you this now for free if you agree that later on the next like two black beans that you see, you have to trade. And if I see you trading that that pinto or whatever that uh, you know whatever bean with so and so our trading's done and it's like what okay you got these long-term deals like there's nothing that's binding in the game so you can literally just say okay i'll give you this for free but then you have to give me this later or okay now you kind of owe me one and you can have these kind of loose agreements and it's also one of those games like most negotiation games where the more you're negotiating the better so you always, I always try and start out friendly and be like listen guys i just want what's best for the farming community it helps me helps you kind of thing if i'm in on most trades and you're not trading even if i'm just gaining these little little um benefits every time over time i'm going to pull ahead and so yeah. it's this game that really rewards people kind of playing loose trash talking making all kinds of ridiculous trades and yeah it's just it's a game that doesn't come out often enough part of it i think is for what it is sometimes it feels a little long sometimes it can go to an hour maybe a little over an hour i wish it would stay in the more 30 to 45 minute range and maybe playing with people who are more comfortable with it more often would get to that point but i just think it's such an underrated game um and especially when people talk favorite uvia rosenberg games this seems to never get mentioned and people just dismiss it because it just looks kind of silly but Bonanza is amazing. Uh, highly recommend it. I just want to say that uh, everything that Carlo gave for reasoning here is actually just a big lie. The reason that this is on his list as underplayed is because it's his secret shame from the time that he taught us the rules wrong. Oh. <laughs> and he just doesn't want to bring it to the table and uh, teach well, us the rules yeah. incorrectly again. <laughs> it was... Tell the people the truth, Carlo. <laughs> it wasn't even all the rules wrong. It was I got taught it as a three-player game, and then I didn't realize that the rules were different for playing it with four players. So he played a four-player game, and it's like... There's certain beans you're supposed to remove or add in depending on player counts. That was all wrong. To be fair, you it was go, still fun. You go through the deck, I think, an extra time. Maybe that's why it also felt like... Yeah, and at the end of the game, I realized, like, oh, I did this wrong. Oh, no, I also did this... Oh, I just realized I felt so bad. But yeah. we've got... It. You guys still loved it, though. Oh, Even it was Even with great. three rules that's wrong. The thing. That's the thing. If the game can have three rules wrong and still be memorable enough that I want to play it again, that says a lot about the yeah, game. Yeah, so. absolutely. Great. But yeah, it goes up to seven players. That is Bonanza. Absolute classic. This game is probably, like, 20 years old or something. Um, yeah, must play. Great pick. All right, my number two. Wait, number three. We, what, what number three at? now. Number yeah, three. yeah. <laughs> I'm gonna have to always ask you. This guy uh, is Mysterium. Oh. Uh, yeah. And this is a great example of a game that I honestly can't even remember the last time I played this game, and it has nothing to do with my enjoyment of it. I'll tell you exactly why. Every time I play Mysterium, I'm always introducing it to people that either haven't played, haven't played in a while. Or whatever, mm. or just need to learn whatever. And so the way that, if for anyone who doesn't know the way Mysterium works, is it's sort of a, it's a, it's a co-op game, but it's one person is in the role of the ghost or the the spirit, and everyone else are the investigator. So it's a one and everyone else. And because of that, and because I'm introducing you people to it, because people haven't played in a long time, I always end up taking the role of the ghost or the spirit mm. like nine times out right. of ten. And so I'm always playing one aspect of the game and. Everyone else is playing the investigators, and I've never even—I I think I've only experienced the game from the investigators' perspective oh, once. Shoot. And so, because of all the place, because like the best, it's two to seven, and the the amount of players to play with that's probably best is somewhere between five and seven. Mm -hmm. The more you have, the more interesting interactions you're having with trying to guess what the communication of the ghost is sure. and all that kind of stuff. So, for me, always having to play. The ghost role wears thin after a while, but at the same time, I get it because someone who's coming into the game for the first time and I'm having to teach to them, being the ghost can be a little intimidating, right? So it's fallen fallen victim to just you know me getting tired of that one role, but also not playing it regularly enough with a certain group that other people are comfortable taking that role. Right, right. If we if we were you know going to the cabin very often with the same group of people or something and always bring a Mysterium because everyone loved it and everyone's taking a turn with the ghost. I feel like I would be getting way more plays out of it and I'd be, I'd be having a lot more fun with it because you realize this person, how they communicate as the ghost versus how this person communicates as a ghost. It's a lot more interesting that way. So it's a great game. I just 
given my circumstances, I just have always played one role and it's worn a little thin. So that's yeah. why it's on this list. It's good. I remember you showed this to me about probably five years ago or so, and we all enjoyed it, but we haven't gone back to it since. And yeah, I'm definitely I curious about what the other role would be like. So yeah. maybe next time, I'll say it right now, next time we play this, yeah. I'll read the rules. I'll take on the role of the ghost so you can play it. Okay, as... you take over the teaching too. Take over all responsibilities. <laughs> <I can't, okay. laughs> I'm just going to kick back. I, I rescind my <laughs> offer, right? You pushed your luck. As Mysterio, my number three. Nice pick. All right. My number three is another small box card game, Arboretum. This is almost on my list, I just want to say. This game packs a punch. It feels almost weird including this on my list because of any game on the list, this is definitely the one I've actually played the most, but it still, I've probably only played it like 10 or 15 times, and it feels like a game that I should have played 50 to 100 times by now. I've owned it for a few years. It plays in 45 minutes to an hour tops. Amazing, amazing game that does so much with so little. Uh, don't let the box art fool you. It looks like a friendly game about trees. Don't buy this for someone who's not a gamer. No, let it fool like, you. That's not, the best part. <laughs> yeah, if you want to rope them in. But basically, all the cards just have like a number and a color, and then there's the name of the tree. But fairly basic game. I won't get into the rules of how you actually lay out your tableau of cards, but everyone starts with a hand of cards. I think it's seven cards in your hand. And there's a common deck of cards, and on your turn, you just start by drawing two cards, and then you play one in front of you, and then you discard one. And then the next player goes and you just go around that until the whole deck is empty and then you score points. But people can draw cards, the, fa the discard piles are all face up. So when you discard a card on the next player's turn, they can take cards either from the face up discard piles or from the deck face down. And at the end of the game, you're going to go through each of the types of trees and only one person will score for that type of tree. Even if four of us have that type of tree in front, only one person scores. And the person who gets the right to score the points is whoever held back the most cards of that value in their hand. So you might be holding on to cards in your hand that you don't even have just because you're trying to have the most in your hand at the end to deny someone else scoring. So it's a super mean game. What I One of the things I love most about this is almost every time I play, there's someone who ends up with zero. I've been that person, <laughs> and it's like I don't even get upset because I just like... Throughout the game, you can sometimes see it happening. Like you just You know there's all these cards out there that you're not seeing, and you're just looking around the table like, which one are you holding? Like... Put those cards that like you just get every turn is like frustrating but we, we talk about these games where the games where we find ourselves like swearing and being so frustrated yeah. every turn are the games we seem to love the most but it's like yeah. the ones where i'm just sitting there like tough decisions are you kidding me yeah just every turn is agonizing i don't want to even play my turns but like that's what makes the game brilliant and it's one that i could just yeah feel like i could play forever so that is arboretum yeah uh, the reason it was almost on my list i'll just say is because specifically a at two players, I actually don't personally enjoy a burrito. Yeah. I, I enjoy it as a three or four player game. And so I just find it too mean at two players. I, I, find, I find that <laughs> I'm trying to play a game with my partner and both of us just end up super <laughs> upset yeah. at each other at the end of it. Um, so yeah, it's, it's a game that I love, love every single time we play three or four, but you really have to have a group that's ready to just, you know, beat each other down for these yeah. for these cards and compete yeah you got to play with someone again who's comfortable with getting zero points and being okay with that that's that's kind of how the game works but not uh, being discouraged by that yeah but and just a note quick note on player count if you play it with two it's just you can count you know what cards are out there you see more of the cards so it's more deterministic whereas with four players i love the reveal at the end where you don't know who's holding what whereas in two player you kind of you've seen all the cards by the end you know where the points are coming with four players there's way more unknown and i just love that reveal at the end um yeah. arboretum uh, one of my favorite small box card games out there i would play this almost every day if i could great pick all right my number two this is also a game that i haven't played in a long time but i love every time i play uh, Mountains of Madness. So this is a very specific kind of game. Um, it's it's almost it's almost um, I don't want to call it a party game, but it has party game feel to it at times. For sure. So you're basically it's a co-op game. You're all trying to scale this mountain, and the, as you scale more and more up the mountain, you're getting more and more madness. And the madness is represented in cards that are going to actually make you have to do things around the table. So for instance, I could get a madness card that says that anytime someone says a certain word, I have to scratch my nose, and that could be an easy one. Whereas another one might be that now anytime I want to communicate numbers in my hand, I have to communicate them with Roman numerals or something. Like there are a bunch of bizarre. Um, cards in here that make everything get hilarious because you're trying to com communicate really valuable information that's in your hand to try to 
pair cards together to be able to meet requirements and I'm going to have to try to communicate that by not speaking or by having my cards constantly face down the table or by turning my back to the rest of the group or by getting up and going into the other room like no one knows what your madness is they just have to interpret why you're doing things yeah. it's hilarious it's tons of fun but it's such a specific kind of game that I find that it falls in this weird middle ground if I want to play a party game this is kind of this is not that and it's kind of right, it's a little more gamey kind of right. than a party game yeah if I want to play a board game it's it's not quite that it, it, it's a board game but it's closer to a party game if, if it's this weird medium that yeah. you have to be in the right mood for. And I, when I played it, I had a great time. But generally, I, I'm wanting to be one of the higher ends of the scale. I either want to sit down and have a more thinky game that is competitive and everything around a table, or even if it is cooperative, that you're trying to figure things out without having to have the, you know, 1% to turn their chair around mm -hmm. and everything. And if I wanted to play a party game, it tends not to be this involved. So because of how specific it is, I've only played this I would say since I've owned it, maybe five times. And the last time I played it was mm. at least two years ago. So it just doesn't get played enough because of yeah. where it falls. That being said, if you have the right group that you're gonna play this regularly, it's gonna be hilarious all the time. Might wear thin after, you know, like, you know, a dozen or two dozen plays, but up until then it's a ton of fun and it's always uh, a lot of a lot of laughs around the table as you're playing. Absolutely. One thing I want to add about it is just like, I love how sometimes you're, because there's timers on stuff, you're trying to do stuff yeah. under a time restriction, and sometimes some people are trying to figure out the goal, where someone else is trying to be like, I think their madness is like every time we do this, and they're like, who cares what their madness is? We've got like problems to solve. It's like, but it's this extra thing. They're like, I think I kind of noticed that pattern where every time this happens, there like, should be bonus like, points. No, I, out well, the yeah, I know, but I just like, I love how that ends up being its own little yeah. mini game that there's always someone fixated on like figuring true. out what other madness is. Yeah, and, it's a yeah. ton of fun. Great it's a great game. game. Yeah. yeah, nice pick. Number two. All right. My number two pick is Vinuge. And yes, it's Vinuge, not Vin Hoss, not Vin Hose, not whatever else you've heard. Vinuge. Uh, this is by Vital Lacerda. I've had this game in my collection for a few years. I believe this was a birthday present from you quite a few years ago. Mm -hmm. um, I've played it probably four or five times by now. I love this game. It's an amazing, amazing worker placement game. If you're familiar with Vital Lacerda games, he often has these big sprawling games. They're usually very sort of heavy in rules, you know, like 15, 20 pages of rules a lot of the time, different systems, portions of the board. In this game, you're basically, it's a, it's basically a winemaking simulator. You run a, a wine company in Portugal. Um, so you, the game is played over six years and every year you only have two actions. So it's basically you have 12 turns in the whole game, which doesn't feel like a lot, but the game can still take two or three hours because sometimes one action chains into this, chains into that. Um, and you're basically, yeah, you're getting different types of wine. You There's wine fairs where judges come and try to judge your wine based on the type of wine or whatever. Um, and you can get sellers to aid your wine. And there's weather events that affect it. All kinds of stuff really surprised me how much it actually felt like an accurate kind of simulator. And then you're buying and selling the wines on the market and all this stuff. The reason why this doesn't get played often enough would be the case with, I imagine, anyone who owns these Vital Lacerda games. If you don't play them often enough, it's easy to forget the rules. Yeah. And I feel like it's the same thing you mentioned with one of the previous games where every time I'm playing it, I'm either the only one who has played it, I'm teaching it new, we play it once, and then we don't play it for like six months, and then I bring it out somewhere and I have to like, we're going through the rules again, and I, I can't tell you how many times I've read the rule book to be like, I gotta be ready for this weekend just in case, and then we don't play it, and then three months go by and I forget most of the rules again, and there's just these little things about it I would love to get it to the table more often with a certain group who could remember the rules and we could get kind of a meta going and play it more. Um, but yeah, sadly, it's just one of those games that I love and doesn't get played often enough, so. And I want I, I want you to play it more often because I don't own it and so I need Carla to teach me every time because it's like three yeah. months between plays. But uh, yeah, I love this game as well. Um, yeah. I got it because I knew, uh, for Carlo, I got it because I knew he would love it, but I knew also I would love it and I get to play it if he <laughs> yeah. owned it. Absolutely. Uh, but yeah, it's a, again, it's one of those things where it really comes down to, I think, you know, if you have a huge board game collection where you play in a multitude of different games, it's more likely a game like this is going to have this problem. Yeah, if you, exactly. If you own, you know, six games and you play those ga six games religiously and, and constantly are getting them to the table, everyone's going to remember the rules of this. You're probably asking, why don't you play this more? Yeah. I think it's just a, it's a symptom of us having large board game collections sure. that unfortunately bigger games tend to have those gaps before the, when they get to the yeah. table. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. But it's a great game. We might be slightly biased because we're both Portuguese. We've been to Portugal numerous times. So like when I'm like, you know, I'm not gonna lie, when I'm looking at this and seeing the regions being like, oh, I remember I visited this place and stuff, it does kind of take me there as well. But uh, yeah. bias aside, it's just an awesome, awesome worker placement game. Um, that is Venus, my number two game. Great pick. Okay, number one on my list. 
most underplayed is Rising mm. Sun. And if you saw our other video on games I can't wait to play after the pandemic, you'll know that this pseudo made it onto the list with Ankh. Um, this game I absolutely adore, but I really have to have the right group together and we basically just have to be getting together to just play Rising Sun. Because it takes a while, it's a game that like, you know, even if it doesn't take a while, everyone's a little bit exhausted and drained after playing Rising yep. Sun, it's yep. so involved that it's a very specific game night when you when you play Rising Sun, for us anyways. So I think we had two or three game nights uh, for Rising Sun specifically, and that's all I've ever played of it. Otherwise, it sits on the shelf waiting for the opportunity for me to play <laughs> with that full group of people yeah. again. Um, I love this game. Every time we have played it, I've just had such fond memories and I've had conversations and text messages and, and groups after talking about like, do you remember this? Do you remember that? And like, yeah. remember that alliance that people formed? Do you remember when they did that shady move? Like, it's it's just such a memorable game. It leads to so many cool conversations. Um, but again, it's just, it's not one that I can just any day say, oh, let's play Rising Sun tonight. Like. Mm -hmm. I have, I, again, with, in a pandemic, it's even harder, but I'm keeping that out of it. It's just even without the pandemic, it has to be like, let's on a Saturday night get these specific people that will enjoy this game together and let's just play just Rising Sun, right? right? It's a little bit of a tougher sell compared to just like, normally we would say, we're going to have these four people over to have play uh, board games. We don't even necessarily have to decide what we're playing. We can all look at the shelf and say, what does everyone want to play? Mm -hmm. This is like, we are playing Rising Sun, right? Yeah, so. and I think part of the reason why we had such success in our first play was because of the way you planned it. We all watched the rules video before we came over. We read about the factions, so we came over knowing kind of what factions we wanted to play, and I, I didn't feel like I was lost from the start. I felt yeah. like I kind of knew what I was doing, so I really enjoyed it right from the first play. Yeah. And uh, yeah, it's definitely one of those ones we got to play more often. And that's the other thing, too, is that if you're, if you're adding someone new into the group who hasn't played it before, they're going to be at a disadvantage not knowing how to play this game. Yeah. Like the, we can teach them, but I feel like you're you're better at it if you played it a few times. So you almost have to introduce that person in, and then maybe yeah. you end up picking a different game because of that. So it, there's challenges to get it to the table, but I mean the miniatures are alone <laughs> are a great reason to get it out just because of how uh, the table presence is of this mm -hmm. game. Uh, but yeah, I love it, and I definitely want to play more of it. It just remains to be seen if I will. So number one, Rising Sun. Nice pick, very nice pick. All right, and my number one pick. I think this one's gonna surprise you. Is Hive. Oh wow, that is a surprise. You know what? I agonized over it for a while because it like part of the reason why it is the number one game on the list is because I haven't played this now in four or five years. Oh, something wow. like that. Like it's been a long, long, long I didn't time. I realize it was that long. It was probably one of the first like ten games I ever bought, I think. Yeah. And I've absolutely loved it every time I play it but it's one of those games where first off it's it's an only two player game for those of you who don't know it's kind of a chess style abstract game you have these uh, sort of bake light ceramic tiles um, and they each have different each player has like a queen bee and then you have different types of bugs there's like ants and spiders and grasshoppers and they each move different ways and the goal of the game is to surround the other players uh, queen bee as soon as your queen bee is surrounded the game really ends and you lose so it's this very back and forth tense game where you start with all these tiles in your supply and you're either adding a tile into play or you're moving a tile that's already in play. So you can either choose to play with the stuff that's already there or keep sort of adding to your, your forces. Um, but the reason why it doesn't get played as often is because it really is one of those games that you have to almost find like a dedicated player to play it with. Yeah. So I would think of this as like, if you ever had like a chess buddy back in the day, um, like in school or whatever, and it's like you had that one person or like, or think of like when we used to play Magic. Yes. Right, it's like we'd play Magic the Gathering over the course of years, and it was like we just knew. But if you were to go introduce some new person to Magic, and they didn't have cards, like it wouldn't be and as only, fun for you or for them. And you only played like every once a month or something like that. Exactly. Right? Yeah. So every time I play this, everyone I've shown it to has been amazed by it. But then, like, again, it's like if I'm playing games with more than two people, it's just never going to get played. Or even like, a lot of people I play two player games with, this might not be their very first choice, so it sits on the shelf and doesn't get played. But I just feel like I want to almost find someone who only likes Hive and doesn't like playing other games, <laughs> so that I can have like a dedicated person that I can play this with a bunch. You just gotta put a personal like uh, a Craigslist that lit up. Yeah, looking well, yeah, Hive, looking for looking Hive, Hive player, player. Yeah, must not like any other games, <laughs> yeah. etc. Yeah, this is no. almost the perfect game. If you if you're like living with like a roommate and you guys play like you know a couple games, mm -hmm. this is almost that perfect game to have that you like are constantly like throwing down a game of Hive like every day or every second day. Yes. You know, like yes. want to want to throw down a quick game of Hive on my lunch break. Like I was gonna like, say, even really a work, easy, yeah. Right? If you had a coworker who liked games and you could play this, like this could be your totally. every single day lunch hour game. This would be the perfect thing. And I feel like I want to get to that level with the game because like 
there's literally like books like ex like strategy guide books written about this game already and there's expansions and there's like a somewhat competitive scene like it is an amazing amazing game that i would love to explore more it just yeah the circumstances make it tough to play regularly but i, I love this game i think it's brilliant yeah and if you're into these two-player abstract kind of back and forth games uh, there aren't many better choices than Hive. It's very quick, uh, very good game that plays differently every single time. Yeah, great pick. That, that's, it, it surprised me when you first put it on, but it, as I thought about it, as you explained, it makes complete sense. Yeah, and I almost overlooked it completely and missed my list because, again, if I were to rank my top games of all time, it's nowhere near the top, but like maybe it will be one day if I were to get to that level with it, right? Right. Yeah. So, yeah, that's my number one, Hive. Great pick. That, uh, that is our list, or both of our lists. Uh, so those are our most underplayed games, or uh, the games we love on our shelves that we just never play. Let us know in the comments, what's the one game on your shelf that you love, that you adore, that you would recommend to everyone, but you just never seem to play? And tell us why, because we are super curious why, why those games that don't hit people's tables. We had to agonize over this because there's so many games we could have included or thought to include, and we thought yeah. about what the criteria is. It's such a cool topic to talk about. I'd love to hear from you. Otherwise, thanks so much for watching, spending some time with us, and we We'll see you in the next one. See ya.